started. My name is Avery Davis Roberts, and I'm an associate director in the democracy program of the Carter Center, and it is my great pleasure to welcome you here tonight on behalf of the Jimmy Carter Presidential Library, the Carter Center, and Acapella Books. We are so pleased to host E.J. Dion and Miles Rappaport for tonight's discussion of their book, 100% Democracy, The Case for Universal Voting. As you may know, for the last 30 plus years, the Carter Center has been supporting democracy and elections internationally, and all of our work on elections is firmly rooted in international election standards that are based on international human rights law. Central among those standards are standards related to, of course, the having the right and the opportunity to vote. But when we look at these international standards, even those standards don't require universal voting. But when I think about international experience, I think one of the things that's most exciting is that it helps us think about and imagine different possibilities for our elections. And as we'll hear this evening, universal voting is a practice in some parts of the world. Australia is the case that is most often cited where they have very high turnout, and I know that will be a part of the conversation this evening. But as we listen to the authors, I would really invite you this evening to imagine what it would be like for us if we had 90% turnout in our elections. What would that mean for who's representing us in our government? What would that mean about our local elections where it is not unusual to have only three to 4% turnout? What would it mean if we had 90% turnout for primaries? In the United States right now, 10% of the electorate selects 96% of the candidates. And those 96% those candidates don't represent necessarily the views of the majority of their party. So imagine all of the things that could happen if we had a different level of turnout. And I think this is where this idea of universal voting is really exciting. So before we, I introduce our, our panelists, because you're a captive audience, and I know you're interested in these issues. I want to also tell you that the Carter Center is hosting next Friday, April 29th, an all-day event called Restoring Confidence in American Elections. We're co-hosting this event with the Baker Institute for Public Policy. We have some really great speakers. It will be live streamed, and we'd really love to have you join us on the Carter Center website if you're interested in learning more. But for the reason that you're here this evening, let me introduce our authors. E.J. Dion is a senior fellow at the Brookings Institution, a syndicated columnist for the Washington Post, university professor at Georgetown University, and visiting professor at Harvard University. In addition, he is a commentator on NPR, MSNBC, and PBS. Miles Rappaport is the senior practice fellow in American democracy at the Ash Center for Democratic Governance and Innovation at the Harvard Kennedy School. He formerly served in the Connecticut State Legislature and as Secretary of State, and he also served as President of Demos and of Common Cause. We are fortunate tonight to also be joined by political reporter Greg Bluestein. Greg covers the governor's office and state politics for the Atlanta Journal-Constitution. He also contributes to um, the political... In Political Insider blog and Morning Jolt newsletter, hosts Politically Georgia podcast, and serves as a frequent guest on local and national TV and radio programs. But most importantly, Greg is also the author of Flipped, a new book on how Georgia became the nation's premier battleground state during the 2020 presidential election. There are also copies of Flipped outside. So, with all of that said, please join me in welcoming E.J. Dion, Miles Rappaport, and Greg Bloonstein. As a cheering section out here. Well, first, it's so great to see everyone in person and so many familiar faces out here. Thank you so much for showing up. My daughter was calling me just now, probably to yell at me about going to the Braves game tomorrow night. She just had milestone tests and she really wants to go see the Braves. Um, before we begin, um, we'll, I'll ask about 30 minutes worth of questions and then around 740, 745, you'll have the chance to ask questions too. Um, but we have a little bit of 
of breaking news um, from a recent uh, appearance uh, from these two authors to talk about first. Miles, do you want to jump in and, and deliver the news? Uh, sure. Thank you, Greg. And uh, I'll just say a quick thanks to the Carter Center for and the Carter Library for having us. Uh, major thanks to uh, EJ for being a great partner in this project. But, uh, you know, our hope in writing the book has been that we want to get the idea of universal voting out into the public domain and hopefully, you know, kind of picked up at a certain point legislatively. And our imagination has been that it would be something that would bubble up from the grassroots um, uh, municipalities and states and et cetera. But we had a little bit of a surprise on Tuesday when we had an event at the old State House in Hartford, and the congressman from the first district in Connecticut came, had read the book, had actually seen us on Morning Joe, um, and decided that he was gonna submit a bill. So there now is a House Resolution 7536, uh, the Civic Duty to Vote Act, filed by Congressman John Larson, uh, which will have a life in, uh, in the United States Congress. So we're very happy about that. <laughs> Uh, and EJ, you know, let, let's start with talking about how you both decided to write this book. Um, you know, American turnout rates are, are usually low. Since the 1960s, they've hovered at about half the voting eligible population. But, but you know, the turnout in recent elections, they've hit generational highs. We even saw record voting participation in states like Georgia, despite efforts to place new obstacles to the ballot box. So you've spent most of your career trying to fix an outdated system. Why is the, why is it now the time to propose something bold and new like this? Well, first of all, thank you. Thank you to the Carter Center. I, I, you know, part of the answer to your question may be that we never thought we'd reach a point where we might want to invite the Carter Center to inspect our election <laughs> and see what was happening uh, in, uh, in elections here in Georgia and around uh, the country. But I want to thank the Carter Center for the extraordinary work that it does. And it's a real honor to be with Greg. I just bought his book, which I had intended to do, and I'm going to read it uh, on a vacation I'm going on soon. And uh, it's for great me, spring this, break reading. This is beach reading, you know. And um, you know, it's a very Did exciting you say peach reading. Yeah, you know, oh, very good. Uh, you know, it's a very exciting book about an incredibly exciting election here in Georgia. So it's a real honor that you agreed to do this uh, with us tonight. Um, it's precisely because of the gains that we made uh, in 2020 and the efforts to roll back those gains uh, that we really think this is the time to advance an idea uh, that we hope would be a kind of game changer in the debate about voting. Um, you know, I, I think one way to look at elections in the United States right now is that they're like fancy dinner parties. You know, at fancy dinner parties, you have an A list and a B list and a C list. Um, well, in elections right now, you've got an A list of likely voters, and those are the people politicians pay all their attention to. They get all the mail, all the attention, all the communications online. And then you got a B list of people who are registered but don't vote very often. They don't get much attention. And then a C list of people who get no attention uh, at all. Um, that has a lot of perverse effects on our uh, politics. For one thing, people tend to do things when they're asked. There's a great Tip O'Neill story. He runs into a friend on the street, says, you know, former Speaker of the uh, House years ago, and runs somebody runs to, into somebody on the street and. Uh, she congratulates him on winning re-election, and he said, well, you voted for me, didn't you? And the per person said, no, I didn't tip. And, and she said, well, why? He says, why didn't you vote for me? And he says, it's, well, you never asked. Um, and it is remarkable how much the difference of asking somebody to come out makes. So we already build a system where we encourage some people to vote, discourage others. <clears throat> but this also has some really uh, terrible effects on campaigning where all the time you spend to gin up the base involves what my friend Miles likes to call campaigns based on enraged to engage. Uh, you'll do anything to turn out that base, some of which is fine, but not all of which contributes to the best kind of dialogue. But then you also spend a lot of time depressing and repressing the other side's base. And we saw that particularly, for example, in 2016 with all the nasty stuff that went out online against Hillary Clinton, which wasn't designed to get people to vote for Donald Trump. It was designed to get Hillary Clinton supporters to stay home. And um, that's a by both parties do uh, some of that. So 
you know, th we think that having everyone vote um, and having a system that requires everyone to vote changes that dynamic because all politicians know um, that uh, everybody's going to be out there, so they have to speak to everyone. And then just briefly, the other reason are, uh, the other reason we want to push this now is because we think declaring voting a civic and legal duty is the very best way to defend voting as a right. And this is a response to the pushback against the gains in 2020, where even with those gains in 2020 and 2018, we got 67 plus percent turnout uh, in uh, 2020, 50 uh, percent turnout um, in 2018, another really high turnout election. Um, that's, that's fine. Uh, it is not the consent of all of the governed. It's still less than in Australia, which has had this system um, where 96% of the voters are registered, 90% uh, of them vote. Uh, we think the U.S. can do better. We've learned from other countries before. We freely steal good ideas from elsewhere. This is one we should steal or borrow or use. <laughs> and I want to get to more about Australia in a, in a moment, but first I want to hit on something you mentioned earlier, how it would, it would change the nature of political campaigns. Uh, I'm a campaign reporter at my heart, so this is near and dear to me. Um, you talked about how there literally are canvassers, and you wrote about this as well, canvassers who ignore people who either rarely vote or never vote. They don't even get a door knock, right? They don't get mailers. They still see the same TV ads they're all subjected to, but they don't get targeted by any campaigns because the campaigns say, why bother? Um, so this will obviously expand the universe of voters. My question is, you mentioned the culture wars, the sort of uh, polarizing issues, but do we lose something if candidates now just appeal to middle of the road issues, or do we end up as a better society because candidates are trying to reach a broader electorate rather than segmented, polarized bases? Do you wanna take that one? Mark? Sure, sure. I'll, uh, well, I, I will say, uh, when I ran, I. Uh, as Secretary of the State and before that a member of the state legislature in Connecticut, I actually ran in 11 elections. And uh, I hated raising money, but I loved knocking on doors. But when I knocked on doors, my campaign staff would give me a list of the registered voters, and then it would be highlighted for what we call then the prime voters, people who were gonna vote all the time. And they basically said to me, when you're going down the street, do not stop and talk to anybody who's not highlighted on the list because they can't help you. And of course, as every campaign consultant knows, the candidate's time is the most valuable commodity of a, of a campaign. So I would literally pass people by on the street and who, uh, who uh, didn't get the, who, who I knew I wanted to talk to, but I couldn't. So I think Every time right. Miles tells yeah. that story, I jump in to say, if you know Miles, by the way, Miles has so much energy that if Europe could tap Miles, they wouldn't have to import another drop of Russian oil. <laughs> uh, but knowing Miles as I do, he would talk to those people, whether they were on the list or not, and his aides would have to drag oh, him away. But anyway, I, uh, that's the only untrue thing what Miles is gonna say tonight. Go ahead, Miles. Right. <laughs> but, speaking, but answering your question, Greg, generically, um, you know, I do think that our, uh, the, the problems that beset us right now in our political system are, uh, among other things, are the extreme polarization that we have. And so campaigns really are exercises of ginning up your own base and in the worst case scenario, uh, depressing or suppressing uh, the vote of your opponent. But if you had a system uh, where everyone was gonna vote and therefore everyone is always listening, then it becomes the, the, the incentive structure changes completely and campaigns need to speak to everybody, make a persuasive case to all voters, not just to the, you know, the ones you're trying to turn out. And I think that would be, in, uh, yes, in some ways it would probably moderate the elections to some degree, but I think on our current, in our current uh, situation, that would be a good thing, not a bad thing, if people had to persuade the full electorate that our ideas are better as opposed to just ginning up our own base. If you look at who doesn't vote right now um, in the same numbers, who, who votes more and who votes less, one of the biggest flaws in our system is the way in which it really pushes young people away from voting. And it's, it's common sense that young people move around a lot. So the registration laws in a lot of our states really make it hard for young people, unlike older people who have the same address year after year, vote in the same polling place. Young people, unless you have something like election day registration, um, it can be very difficult. They may engage in the campaign in the last month like everybody else, 
but the deadline is passed, so they can't even vote in the new place they live. Uh, another group that is uh, uh, l represented less at the polls are lower income people uh, across races. Uh, and uh, that's one reason why we would insist this is not a, um, a help Democrats win every election act of 2022 because high turnouts don't consistently help Democrats look at Virginia in the governor's race in 2021 under laws that made it very easy to, uh, for uh, people to vote, but so but lower income uh, people would vote, and it would um, get rid of the in, uh, get rid of the incentives. Indeed, it would make it impossible uh, to have the voter suppression measures that target very specific groups of voters, where politicians pass laws that make it much harder for certain groups, especially uh, often black Americans, Hispanics, Latinos. Um, to vote, and no, under this system, uh, you would have to make it every for, easy for everyone to vote because you are declaring that they have the duty to vote. And so we propose a slate of reforms, a suite of reforms um, that you know have been adopted around the country because of the pandemic. We want to push those forward so that everybody can vote more easily. And so you mentioned the pandemic. Um, we saw this firsthand in Georgia, but I'm curious for both of your perspectives. How did the pandemic spark electoral reforms, and, and what can we learn going forward from what happened in, in 2020 um, here in Georgia and elsewhere? Well, in uh, the 2020 election, as EJ said, were the, was the highest turnout uh, of, of any presidential election, really ever, um, uh, but still at 66 or 67 percent, which is not anything to write home about. But I do think that, what, that one of the reasons, I mean, there were a number of reasons why the turnout was so high, although I put it a little bit in the air quotes. Mm -hmm. um, uh, one of the reasons was, of course, the you know, major political dynamics with the Trump administration and, and people coming out. And another was the tremendous organizing work that was done on the ground, at Georgia being kind of the, the premier case in point for that, that people really were motivated and organized to come out. But the Which you can read about in the book Flipped, by the way. <laughs> uh, On but, sale outside. <laughs> but I think one of the reasons was that, uh, was that people had more opportunities and more different ways in which they could vote. Um, so uh, despite the pandemic, you know, uh, mail-in voting was vastly expanded. Early voting was significantly expanded. Uh, the ways in which absentee ballot restrictions were, uh, were taken off. In some places, they had overnight voting. You know, so that, so that people made the uh, accommodations to make it possible to vote, and that was a really, really good thing. And unfortunately, we have here in Georgia and many other places, you know, serious, um, malevolent, I will say, uh, attempts to roll that. There was even a 24-hour voting. Uh, in Houston, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. I always say I was very proud to cast my mail ballot in a drop box in front of Walt Whitman High School in Bethesda, Maryland. And I was proud of that, A, because all three of our kids went there, but B, Walt Whitman is the poet of American democracy, so I felt a little poetic when I was dropping it in there. But we are becoming two nations when it comes to voting. If you look at what's happened since 2020, 25 states have actually expanded access further, but 19 states have moved to roll back these expansions. But one of the reasons we sort of think putting out an adventurous idea now is promising is because there has been a democracy movement going on in a lot of our states uh, for 20 years. And you know, in our book, as you know, we have a little chart about changes um, over, you know, over the last 20 years between 2000 and 2020. Election day registration, six states in 2000, 21 states now. Uh, early in-person voting from 22 to 43, no excuse absentee voting from 22 to 34 states. So you're seeing some pressure around the country to make voting more convenient. We think we can build on that and say, let's finish the job. You, you both write clear-eyed about the challenges ahead. Um, the fact that public polls still show that there is resistance to this idea. Um, but you also write about gateway reforms. Um, steps that states can start taking, that, that governments can start taking. Can you talk a little bit about um, what, what gateway reforms you could see being enacted in the, in the not so distant future? Yes, and the, you know, the, so I would say, I would describe it in a way as a suite of uh, policy items that organizations that are uh, 
uh, attempting to expand democracy and expand voting have taken place. So same day voter registration is, as EJ mentioned, is really, really important. It has been shown to up turnout by anywhere around three to 5% in the states that it's been. Automatic voter registration, where anytime you have a uh, um, contact with the Department of Motor Vehicles or other uh, state agencies, you get registered. Um, Pre-registration of 16 and 17 year olds so that you can get high school students before they get out of school. Uh, the restoration of voting rights for people with felony convictions, which has actually made significant advances uh, over the last 10 years. Um, early voting, uh, early in-person voting, and also the expansion of mail voting. So all those things. I mean, it's clear that if you uh, kind of, from the sky, uh, impose a, a universal voting requirement on a system that is discouraging people from voting, that's a mismatch. Uh, we don't really think it would happen, but in order to, for it to be really successful, uh, having these reforms in place would be a really, really good thing. You know, um, I, I've been saying that uh, our book shows that we are either two very honest book writers or two of the dumbest book writers ever, <laughs> because we actually did our own polling, which shows that right now most people don't support yeah. our idea. Uh, our own polling in February of 2020 showed that 26% of Americans supported this idea. 48% opposed it very strongly. Uh, and uh, another, I think it's 12% or something, opposed, were against it. Um, so the way I looked at those numbers is 26% for an idea that many say runs against the American grain that no one has ever argued for before. I thought 26% was pretty good. And that when you looked at the opinions of the people uh, who weren't strongly opposed, they were clearly uh, uh, persuadable. So the way we see it is you go into this with about half the country at least open to persuasion. Um, but there are a couple other things in that polling that we found. One is our core idea that voting is both a right and a duty. We asked the question, is it a right and a duty? Is it a right but not a duty and so on? 61% of Americans, equal numbers in both parties, agree that it is both a right and a duty. So the core idea behind our proposal uh, is correct. And then we asked people who uh, were for it or against it why they were for it or against it. And we were more interested in the people opposed to it um, because we wanted to see, all right, what arguments do we need to advocates of this idea need to answer? One of them was in your question, which is you just can't impose this system on a system that has uh, voter suppression involved. And so we go to some length uh, to deal with that. Um, there is also an old-fashioned American sort of libertarian objection, how dare you tell me that I must vote? And we have structured this, as the Australians do, much more as a nudge than a push or a hammer on anybody. Um, the fine is $20 max. Um, the way it works in Australia, which we would imagine how it works here, is you get a little notice in the mail if you didn't vote, saying you didn't vote, can you tell us why? Anybody with a reasonable excuse doesn't pay the fine, so only 13% of people in Australia actually end up paying. Actually, 13% of non-voters, non so it's like 1% yeah. of the population. Yeah, 1% of the population ends up paying the fine, so it's not a heavy-handed system. Um, many people worry rightly about how fines and penalties are sort of uh, piled up on low-income people, especially low-income people of color. We make clear uh, it's 20 bucks is 20 bucks, no interest. It's not a criminal penalty. Um, and just to make absolutely sure, there are two important other aspects of this. One is um, if you really object to participating in the political system, you can file as a conscientious objector, just as people can apply to file in, when we've had a draft in the past. Um, we, it, this, we don't call it compulsory voting because you don't have to vote for anybody on the ballot. You simply have to participate the way you have to participate in jury duty. So you can cast a blank ballot, uh, you can write in Greg's name on the ballot, you can scrawl a message across. Lucy for prime minister. Yeah, there you go. Uh, you, can, you can do anything you want with the ballot. You just have to participate. Um, and just to make clear that we're not compelling anybody to speak, we would add a none of the above option. So we've tried really hard to answer what are, you know, at least at, in, you know, at first blush, the obvious problems people would have. 
And what we found is these, the nudge approach in Australia, as opposed to more heavy-handed approaches elsewhere, the nudge works better. You don't need anything overwhelmingly tough. It really simply changes the culture of elections where everybody expects that they are, uh, they're being invited to participate in a sense, and everybody expects everybody to do it. Greg, let me, can I just pick up sure. on one thing that, uh, that EJ just said, and that's the analogy with jury duty, because I find it very persuasive and very important, because, and it goes to the question of a right and a duty, which is, in, uh, in the case of jury service, everyone is required to serve, in, to serve on a jury if you are called. And the reason for that we have done that is so that you have a jury pool uh, that is fully reflective of the population as a whole. Uh, the people who are judging guilt and innocence and the appropriate punishment ought to be fully reflective. I think that uh, analogy holds to voting absolutely, which is the decisions that are made about you know, how we live, the laws that govern us, and the people who are gonna make the decisions about those laws ought to be made by a fully reflective electorate. And we don't have that now as, as EJ was describing. So I think the, the idea that the consent of the governed is the consent of all the governed, and we want it to be a fully reflective population, uh, representation of the population, I think is a very powerful and persuasive analogy in my mind. I want to ask you more about Australia because I was completely fascinated. I think it was chapter four where you go into Australia and the two dozen or so other countries that have uh, adapted some form of the system. Um, but first, can you explain to the audience what a democracy sausage is? Oh, I love talking about <laughs> democracy sausages. Um, one of the, the, one of my favorite quotes in the book is from somebody who told the New York Times, in Australia, elections are like a party. Uh, and they really are because, you know, again, 100 years they've been using this system. So if that isn't adequate proof of concept, I don't know what is. Most people who propose a reform don't have 100 years of experience behind it. And because everybody votes, they vote on a Saturday, so most people have the day off. Um, so, and, and they have other ways of voting. You can vote early, you can vote outside your own district. So it, it, it's not just election day voting, but because they make it easy to vote, because they have so many polling places, because people don't have to spend six hours in line uh, to wait to vote, um, it's a party atmosphere around all the polling places, school groups and community groups. Um, you know, the people in your neighborhoods who do good things uh, raise money by selling all sorts of good things to eat um, at the polls. I say the only real knock on our system is everybody would gain about five pounds if it became <laughs> like Australia. And one of the things that uh, Australians actually talk about a lot are the democracy sausages or the democracy sizzlers, where the sold at virtually every polling place as part of this fundraising is the democracy sausage. And um, the Board of Elections in Australia has a sense of humor. They actually put out a, semi, a formal statement saying that um, the onion should go on top of the democracy sausage. <laughs> um, and just for uh, uh, everybody's sensibilities, we embrace democracy sausages, but suggest that if we do this, there should be vegan alternatives. Yeah. <laughs> for, for those of us who don't eat pork too, something like brisket maybe? Yeah, well that was, you could make it, you could, oh, we could have beef sausage. There you go. What, what struck me too was- Chicken sausage. Right? A, a, a whole variety of sausage. Exactly, we could have anything. Um, but there was also a, a part of that chapter that talked about how um, there was an expert who said how shocking, marveled at how the Western media, that US media has hardly written given zero, almost zero attention to the fact that Australia's had this system um, for, for uh, generations now. Why do you think that is, and do you think that makes it harder for you to push um, this idea now? Well, part of it's Australia's a long way off. It yeah. doesn't get enough coverage. Um, I've had the blessing of going there a bunch over the years and, and have gotten interested in Australian politics. Um, so I think, and partly because Australia has never been a troublesome country for us, and you know, Greg, that the media tend to cover problems, uh, and Australia's not been a problem uh, for us. Uh, but the Australians love the attention. I was on a very popular talk radio show there a couple of weeks ago uh, where they devoted a half hour to two Americans wandering around talking about how great the Australian system uh, is. And it was interesting because I was on with an Australian academic who spoke of challenges to the system and how it needed to be defended. Uh, to make sure it was never rolled back or cut back. Um, but there's no move to get rid of it. It's, it's accepted by both parties. They're having an election 
right now. And there's, and, and you know, it's not like Australia gets these huge turnouts because everyone loves their candidates. I mean, there's disillusionment right now with both of the candidates, but people are gonna go out uh, and cast their ballots. Australia also has the rank, rank choice voting, um, which I think is we, we don't, we, you know, our book is about this idea. We're trying to sell one idea at a time. Um, but we're both sympathetic to ranked choice voting, which is a way of really expanding the way in which voters can give voice to what they think and feel. Um, and the and avoid runoffs. I'm sorry? And avoid runoffs. Yes, and avoid, yeah, it's an instant runoff. Yeah. Um, yeah, saves money, too. Yeah. Um, and, you know, and, and so Australia has both of those things uh, together, and it works quite well. You know, Greg, I want to just pick up on what you said about the fact that it has received so little attention, because this has to do with how I got into this in the first place, which is that, so as, you know, in, in all of my various roles as, as a legislator, and actually, let me stop right there for a second. When I was a legislator, we had a thing called the point of personal privilege, where you could sort of stop debate on important topics and just, you know, introduce your family if they were in the gallery. Mm -hmm. So I want to take two points of personal privilege. One, uh, George Chip Greenwich is here, who in addition to being an Atlanta uh, activist is also a a fellow at the Ash Center with me. So George, great to see you here. And, and one of my true heroes, State Senator Nan Orock, who has been my friend and colleague and compadre in crime in many, many ways. It's great to see both of you. But I have been working on these issues for 35 years uh, in the legislature as president of Demos, as president of Common Cause. And I really believe in all of them, and you know, but I feel, as I said before, we have moved the needle a little bit, but not very far. But in 2015, I actually read a piece that EJ uh, had written with a colleague of his at Brookings, William Galston, making the case that America ought to adopt the Australian system. And I had two reactions. One was, wow, this is a really big idea. This could really move the needle. After 35 years of moving the needle like this much, mm -hmm. this is an idea that got, got Australia from 60% to 90% turnout and has stayed there for 100 years. This is a big idea. And my second reaction was, how is it that I've been involved in this for 35 years, Australia's had this for 100 years, and I have never been in a single conversation about it? I mean, what is it about our unwillingness to learn from abroad from good ideas? Uh, so anyway, I was delighted, and EJ is part of the reason that I'm sitting oh, that's here that's fascinating. Uh, we're going to open up to questions after one more from me, and I'm going to cheat and ask a question posed by Kennedy School Professor Brooks in your book and ask you um, the, your answer to this question. But what would happen if we took the resources now devoted to protecting the right to vote and turning our votes and instead, turning out our votes, and instead devoted them to social justice and to movement building? What would our democracy look like? EJ? Ooh, well, uh, th that's a great question, and, and I Cornell I came up was central, central to our project. In fact, former uh, chair of the NAACP. The NAACP, by the way, has endorsed this idea. Um, so there are two things about uh, this idea in terms of its effect on all of the apparatus we have to turn out people, voter protection at the polls and the like. Um, you would either substantially cut the cost of campaigns because the amount of money that is spent to get people registered to vote, to protect them when they get to the polls so they can cast uh, their vote, to protect their right at the polls, um, consumes hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars in every uh, election. I'm trying to look up to add up the number because uh, it's hard to find because a lot of it's done by outside, some dark money groups, some, uh, but a lot of it's in the open. And uh, so either you would cut the cost of campaigns but groups that are dedicated now simply to doing something that the government really ought to be doing. The government shouldn't put barriers to make it, make it uh, to, for you to register. Government should help register everybody as they do in Australia. One of my research assistants, uh, Amber Hurley, um, came into my office after looking at an Australian government website and just very excited and said, look at all these cool things Australia does to make it easier for people to register and vote. We can do that. Um, so you, you put that over here, uh, and then people could spend that money, these groups and these organizers could spend that money either advancing their ideas for improving the country, making a case to people uh, for um, ideas, reforms, new approaches. Um, you could, you would again, you'd be communicating with everyone um, and lots of people would have, uh, a lot of the people who do this work are very, 
person to person oriented. Uh, they like knocking on doors like Miles does. And so you would have much more, you'd have organizers contacting people about issues. You could pull a lot more people into participation in other aspects of uh, civil society. So a truer democracy. Miles, do you have a? Yeah, no, I would absolutely add that. And, the, but, but I, and I also think that one of the things, going back to the, the uh, Tip O'Neill story that EJ said before, is that this is a way of inviting people into the process. I mean, if you're not registered, if you're not on the list, you don't get mailings. You don't get, you know, you don't get the text messages. You don't get all of the ways in which people are communicated with. And if you are communicated with, it brings you into the process. There is uh, studies that have shown that when people are required to vote in the countries that are, they are, they actually do spend the time uh, educating themselves, finding out who the candidates are, finding out about the issues, and uh, and I think there's a an, so we're we're right now the, the one thing I want to say is we're right now I think in a in a vicious cycle in this country, which is that the lap, lack of participation means that government is not responsive to the people who are not participating, so they're more responsive to the likely voters and certainly to the donors, <coughs> another huge problem. Mm -hmm. That creates a, a government that doesn't do as much for ordinary people as it should, which then increases the cynicism, and there we go. And now we have, uh, you know, and uh, uh, lots of problems as a result. But we are hoping to create a virtuous cycle. So if you uh, state and, and, you know, pose that everyone is going to vote, then people come into the process. Government, I think, will become more responsive. There is some evidence that, you know, people who, when, when everybody is voting, the policies of the government reflect more of, uh, of low income, the needs of low income people. Um, so I think you can get us an upward cycle and that's what we're hoping to do. We wanna put this out, by the way, last point I'll make. Uh, we don't say that people should do this in, instead of what they're doing now. We need all the work on same day registration. We need all the work on, on uh, mobilization of voters. But we wanna put this out as a North Star of what it is that we might really hope for. And that is a democracy, a 100% democracy where everyone is participating. And we think if we put that out there and we start the discussion, good things will come from it. By the way, a brief shout out to Georgia, if I could, which is that the probably the world's expert on this is a professor at the University of Georgia named Shane Singh, uh, who is incredibly helpful to us in putting uh, together the book. He's got a big book on um, mandatory voting um, that's really important, but, and he helped us find, he found all kinds of great studies. My favorite is parties at election time are associated with significantly higher turnout. So if we combine celebrations with election day, uh, more people would vote. And so instead of taking water away from people at the polls, give them a sausage. No. Or a democracy brisket. <laughs> Uh, or brisket. Or, or brisket, yeah. <laughs> okay, let's open it up some questions. How are we gonna do this? Yeah, so, oh. um, hey there everybody. I'm Frank Reese from Acapella Books. Um, thanks for being here. And uh, I'm sorry Tony Clark is not here. He would usually be playing this role, but uh, the first thing he would say is to point out the uh, microphones on either side of the chapel. If you do have a question, uh, if you'd step up there and we'll uh, take turns on either side. Uh, and the other thing Tony always makes a point of is he gets to ask the first question, so that's what I'll do. Um, Miles, I, I wanted to ask this of you. Most of the focus of your conversation, and by the way, the conversation has been really great, um, has been on how to get voters you know, motivated to vote in greater percentages. We ha I haven't heard much, and you as a former elected official, um, what do you suppose or maybe first-hand knowledge, what have you heard from actual people who hold elective office, what kind of response to a system like this would, would they likely have? Right. Uh, let me make th uh, three points of response. So we, we have expected from the moment we started thinking about the book that we would get two different responses. One, you know, a certain level of cynicism or at least skepticism, which is, geez, we're having a hard enough time keeping the imperfect democracy that we have, and you want to, you know, have this big, far-sighted idea about it. What are you crazy? Um, and that's one, and we've gotten some of that. But we've also gotten a lot of wow. This is a big idea. I've never thought about it. Let's you know. Let's real. Let's discuss it. This is a good. This is you're doing a, a good thing to put this discussion out. Second point I would make is that, you know, we see this as an organizing project. I mean, just putting a book out there. Uh, except for flipped, of course, uh, but just putting a book out there doesn't make it happen. But what we do want to do is, is on three levels, really move the, the whole 
uh, effort forward. One is to get the idea out in journalistic and academic and ideas journals and all that. Second is that to take the democracy movement that EJ mentioned before and put this on the agenda for organizations like the NAACP, like Common Cause, like Demos, like other organizations that then can help to push it. And then we do want to see it uh, uh, enacted legislatively. So uh, it can be done, ap I mean, delighted that we have a piece of federal legislation now that's at least thinking about this, but state legislatures could definitely do it, and there are definitely some states that are interested in, uh, in at least you know, putting the bill in and having it debated. It is also possible to do it in municipalities. You know, you, they, you may need some state enabling legislation, uh, you know, in certain situations, but it is possible. So our idea is to sort of get it out there, begin to move it, and have it bubble up uh, into a real uh, viable, uh, viable policy that can be adopted in different places. Uh, there's an appendix to our book that is the bill got introduced in Connecticut, uh, and we just put you put the bill in, a, in uh, the Connecticut version just to show people, yes, this can be done. But I was particularly proud because the bill was sponsored by one of my former students named Will Haskell, who got elected to the state senate at age 22. Wow. And um, he put this out there and actually got into an argument with the Wall Street Journal. And this 22-year-old state senator held his own against the Wall Street Journal editorial page. Uh, I am awaiting, I really want them to review this book because I think they won't like it. And I'd love to have an argument with my friends at the Wall Street Journal <laughs> about it. <laughs> Is that a, do you have a question over here? If you step up to the mic, please. Thanks. Incidentally, we welcome completely skeptical questions because we are, as our own polling shows, we are acutely aware there's a mountain to climb here. And so it's, uh, we've learned, uh, we've been doing this for several weeks now and have learned at every stop from people who ask the question. So thanks for doing it. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. Uh, my name is Michael Carswell. Um, I'm actually here because of uh, Chip Greenidge, uh, my mentor and professor. But I come from like a, like a jazz studies like background. I'm actually studying that in college, so I'm kind of clueless about all of this. But it sounds awesome what you guys are talking about. So my question is, what can um, college or state university like students do to help push this universal act thing that you guys are suggesting? Miles, the organizer, has to. Uh, Miles is such an organizer. I, I've said to people that if when Miles goes to heaven. He's going to organize the angels into a union. So, uh, so Miles is actually on this case. So, thanks for your question. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, thank you. Yeah. Well, the, I mean, I think the first thing, the kind of base level, is that uh, colleges should really make major efforts to uh, make sure that everyone in the in the school is registered. And there are a lot of you know, there's the Campus Voter Project. Um, there's Students Learn, Students Vote. There are different organizations that are pushing this idea, and I think it's really important. And you can get to a pretty good level at the colleges. But I also think that, you know, this should be something that uh, becomes part of the curriculum and part of the reading lists for college courses on democracy. You know, let's have, God knows we're going to have a, plenty of uh, readings about how awful things are and how many threats there are to democracy. It would be nice to have, one of the reactions we've gotten is, gee, it's nice to have somebody thinking big and thinking forward and thinking optimistically. So I think that uh, you know, getting the discussion out there and also when there are uh, legislative proposals that are introduced, make sure that there's organizing on campus in support of them. But thanks for the question. Yeah, we definitely want to do it. So Miles point. is setting up something called the 100% Democracy Initiative, uh, which is trying to forward this in various states. It's also, I think, fighting efforts to keep students from voting. One of my favorite voter suppression measures was the voter ID law in Texas, where you could use your concealed carry permit to vote, but you could not use your government-issued student ID from one of the state <laughs> universities. Now, you wonder, what might be going on there? And so, I think you should, you, I, and, and the registration that universities, community colleges can do. Um, there's been a lot of good work on that in the last five years, and so if your school doesn't do it, they can help uh, you know, get people engaged. Uh, real quick to the point about the positive outlook you mentioned, the Washington Post wrote that your book was undergirded by optimism, urgency, and a bit of naivete, the sort welcomed in a genre that is otherwise bleak. So that, that hit the point of it. Sorry. My favorite line in that nice review, thank you. Yeah, <laughs> love it. Yeah, first I want to thank you for your comments about ranked choice voting. I, help it, I think it helps bring candidates more toward the center, uh, illustrated by Lisa Murkowski and Susan Collins. 
in the U.S. Senate. Uh, but my question is, uh, given the libertarian streak in this uh, U.S. Supreme Court, um, I can imagine a situation where a voter gets, uh, a non-voter gets a uh, postcard saying you owe $20 for not voting and files a lawsuit. And the U.S. Supreme Court says the right to vote includes the right, right, the right not to vote. What uh, your comment? You know, I... Some of you, um, well, I am old enough to remember that when Richard Nixon got asked a question he didn't want to answer, he would always say, I'm glad you asked that question. <laughs> but in this case, I really am glad you asked that question because, uh, and it's come up a lot, and it makes me very happy because we have a whole chapter largely written by some lawyer colleagues who helped us on this, on the constitutionality of this idea. And, it, and we structure it very specifically uh, in line with the case law. Now, let me, before I say anything else, if I will never predict how this particular 6-3 majority is going to uh, rule, and God knows where they would go with this, given what they've done with voting rights already. I mean, they've gutted the Voting Rights Act not once, but twice. Uh, so who knows what this particular court will do. But we make, I, I, I hope it will be for people, and maybe even the Supreme Court, a persuasive argument that um, government can prescribe conduct. It can require people uh, to serve on juries or to go to do jury service. Um, it can require parents to send their kids to school uh, until they're 16 or homeschool them according to certain standards. That's a pretty big intrusive requirement. There are all kinds of other affirmative things government asks people to do from wearing seatbelts um, to uh, which I confess I was a bad seatbelt wearer until there was a law, uh, until I actually got a ticket once. Um, the uh, or seatbelts or helmet laws. I mean, there are a lot of or laws now that we have to have people buy. You got to buy car insurance. There are all kinds of uh, behavior. What government can't do, we think, and our lawyers think, um, is force you to speak. Uh, and that's why we go out of our way in structuring the proposal in keeping with all the case law um, that we are not requiring anybody to speak. That's why you can cast the blank ballot. That's why we add the none of the above option just to underline that. And um, if you get the book, um, you can read our chapter and see how well we did. But our, um, you know, the team of lawyers who are part of a working group that Miles and I organized, uh, that Miles really, or Miles and I co-chaired, um, did an extraordinary job at uh, dealing with these legal issues. I don't know, Greg, if you, were you persuaded by our legal brief? <laughs> <laughs> it, it brought me back to my days of working for the Daily Report with the legal newspaper here. That it felt like I was going through law school even though I didn't. <laughs> but it was great. Yes, sir. Uh, thanks. I, I appreciate the uh, discussion. I, I'm very much in favor of it. So, uh, uh, Bless you. Thank you. Yeah, no, I mean, I've been thinking of it for a long time, so it's nothing new, but uh, here, glad it's uh, being codified uh, a little more uh, solidly. Um, I, I do wonder and worry about the comparison of Australia systems, considering a couple of generations ago when they looked at a mass shooting and decided to act in a way that we could never imagine acting here around guns and violence, but that's, that's off, the, off the point. Um, you answer the question about uh, constitutionality, and that's, I, I need to read the book to, to appreciate the arguments better, because I was worried about that. But I do think that the, um, the, the, the hope of the bill moving forward is, uh, is challenged significantly, especially in the House, when a very large majority of seats are um, very much customized to the, uh, the base, um, who will see that as a threat. And that would be the biggest concern, I would think. So thank you. Appreciate it. You know, and it's, uh, you, you touch on it, you, you at least glance at, a, at, a, at an important point, which is that we are not making the case that if universal voting were enacted, uh, that would solve all the problems of American democracy. It won't. Uh, gerrymandering and redistricting, you know, unfairness will continue. The, un un the untoward role of money, big money in American politics, the completely undemocratic nature of the, of the, of the U.S. Senate itself, um, the presence of the Electoral College, all these are structural, I would call them structural deformities in our system, which this doesn't address. But there is a very big lane here that this does address, which is the low levels of participation, the uh, uh, inability of, of, of the system to really pull people in and have people uh, decide. So that's right. But 
uh, we don't make the case that this will uh, solve all of those problems and those things will absolutely still exist. So there'll be reason for other people to keep working on this. Uh, the other thing, if, if I took your question right, um, and please tell me if I, if I misunderstood it, you were suggesting that, say, people on the very, very progressive side of the Democratic Party or the very conservative side of the Republican Party wouldn't like it because it might produce a more moderate electorate. Is that, did, uh, did I get that right? Because I think it's interesting to think about that. I think on balance, it does bring in less ideological voters, almost definitionally, because the people who are intense ideologues tend to vote. Uh, so you're right that it creates a certain kind of moderation in the electorate. By the way, the gentleman on the transferable vote creating a more moderate um, uh, results, I think it works both ways, actually. I think it can create more moderate results. I think it also gives opportunities to third parties that are currently not in the system where you can express a preference for a third party you like without defeating the candidate you prefer between the two parties. So, you know, if you're a Green, you can vote one Green, but then two Democratic. If you're a Libertarian, you can vote one Libertarian, two uh, Republican, um, say. Um, you know, but I, I think that in our case, because young people are so radically underrepresented uh, in our electorate, um, it would bring in some sort of new blood and potentially more uh, progressive people uh, because low-income people are systematically underrepresented. I think both of those are things that progressives would like. I do agree. I have a Republican friend. I'm trying to get him to come out and endorse the idea uh, who said he really wants it because he thinks it would make it easier for more moderate conservatives to take the party back because it would force uh, everybody to compete for this broad electorate. And we quote an Australian politician saying, you know, the voters this system brings in would not have a lot of time for QAnon nuts. Mm. Uh, and I think that might be an advantage of the system. <laughs> I don't know. There are a lot of QAnon people in Georgia. Hi, Andrea Young. Um, I'm the head of the ACLU in Georgia. And I think Thank I'll you. talk with some of my team earlier today at the he, gathering. My spot. former student, he was all, yeah. he's awesome. Excellent. Yeah. Good, good, good. So we um, one of the challenges in Georgia uh, is that we vote a lot. So in an, you know, in twenty the twenty twenty cycle was at least five and pos and could have been six, uh, and maybe seven, depending on some local jurisdiction. And so one of the challenges you know, for us, it, you know, for this would be to say, I mean, one of the, I mean, and it's a voter suppression technique, right? Because if, you know, if you've got a regular life, you know, you can't spend time thinking, you know, seven, seven times a year, who you're going to vote for. So how, I mean, how would you see addressing that kind of an issue in this sort of a system and the extent to which you think ranked choice voting um, would be an option, which I kind of hesitate because we just had a mayor's election and if it hadn't been for the runoff, we might not have liked the result. But I think we're all happier with the result that came from the runoff. But um, even people who voted for somebody else the first time. So it, you know, I mean, I think those are some, some challenging questions in, in, in a lot of the, you know, places where we, we have these, these runoffs and these just interminable elections and right. special elections and... No, I think it's a good point, and it is something that we have talked about in the, uh, both in the book and also in the, in the working group. Uh, I do, first of all, the, the, the book makes a, a kind of a broad template of, re of recommendation. The details, in the weeds details, would be crafted in the legislation that each state would do or each municipality would do based on its own election system. Um, we do think that uh, some consolidation of elections would be really, really helpful. In Australia, they have far fewer, uh, and, they're, and putting them on the same day, you know, having some of these elections in May and June, and then some in September and October. Anyway, so I think that would be, that would be a good thing. On the other hand, I will say this, that so we, we recommend this for major elections in the book. We don't actually recommend it for party primaries. They're, a whole, they're kind of a very different uh, constitutional construct. Um, but if you think about it, for a school board election, which t typically is really low uh, election, you could make a pretty good case that how our children are educated 
is something that everyone ought to be deciding, not the 11% of the people who, who come out in a school board election. So I would love to see some municipalities say, you know, for our school board elections, we want everybody to participate. So I could see this not just for the big presidential and Senate elections, but also for some municipal elections as a way of just really changing the, the, the equation of how people think about it. Yeah, your question is so well taken because all the elections we have, our turnout probably is a little better than it looks because if you ask the question not did you vote in the last election, but did you vote at least once in the last five elections or four or three or pr the primary but not the election, you get a, you get a higher uh, number. I looked at that some years ago. And so, yeah, there is something about consolidating elections um, that's a good idea. By the way, one, one question we get a lot is, why, are you, why don't you have incentives instead? And we actually talk in the book about um, various incentive systems, some of which have worked in other countries, some haven't worked well. We're intrigued with the idea of uh, a refundable tax credit for everybody who registers to vote. Um, you know, 50 bucks, 100 bucks. Um, Ayanna Presley, the congressman from Massachusetts, has been interested in that idea. First, it would take all the pressure off the fine because, in effect, you'd just be giving back part of your fine, a uh, part of your tax credit, uh, for not completing the job, in a sense. We do it for registration, not voting, because, again, our lawyer friends said that it might be construed as a bribe uh, if you gave it to, for voting, but registration, again, is an act. So we, we are for 100% democracy so much that we're all for uh, well-designed incentive systems if they would help us, uh, help us along. Our last question. Thank you, I'm Carla. And here comes the skeptical question. Oh good, thank you. Um, I, how can we ignore the elephant in the room? And I literally mean the elephant. It's become um, a really convenient <laughs> phrase, hasn't it? <laughs> when in Georgia, I've lived in Georgia over 25 years. I have voted in every election since I registered to vote. I'm 55 in June. I am the person that pollsters call. I have voted in every election in Georgia since I moved here in 1998 because I'm from Mississippi originally and there's a history. So I take it very seriously. I live in an affluent African American community here in Atlanta and my polling place has changed almost every year. And, and despite the fact that I vote all the time I have to be careful to make sure that it's where it says it's going to be. So all of this sounds amazing, the sausages in Australia. <laughs> but in uh, Georgia- These guys came here and all they sold us was sausages. You know? <laughs> <laughs> but in Georgia, they won't even allow us to give out water. In, in my polling place, which despite being a very active polling place, there's a long line. My friends who live in the northern part of the city don't have that issue. My niece, who is an hourly wage person, doesn't have my luxury to be able to stand with my daughter and make sure that we vote, no matter how long the line is. So I'm sorry to be skeptical, but I am so tired. I am so tired. I am just tired. And I will vote, I will crawl over glass to vote. And I have, but this sounds wonderful and the laughter is great, but it's not the same journey. And I'm sorry. Just, no, please it, don't it, just, it just isn't, it isn't the same. It isn't. And you can see it here or whether it's in Florida today, but you know, we voted. When, when voting is easy, people vote because people want to vote. Look what happened in 2020. But you know what happened after that? Laws were passed to change non-existent problems, to keep people from voting. So voting in America, we want to vote. We want to vote. But you cannot ignore what's going on. And last but not least, why does the press always say both sides? It is not both sides. And I'm not going to say which side is doing what, because we know. So please stop saying that. One side wants you not to vote, period. And you can, I'm not gonna say what side it is. 
but it is what it is. Thank you so much. I am truly enjoying you. I mean, I, I want to say first thanks for your witness and also thanks for voting against whatever, all the obstacles uh, that are there. And I think that um, you know, one of the things we learned from the civil rights movement and the voting rights movement is that people who fought for the right to vote, who had to fight for the right to vote, appreciate the right to vote more uh, than any of the rest of us. That's why there are all those things in town rightly named after John Lewis. Um, and we, uh, first of all, uh, this is not coming from our book. This is coming from your point. You're 100% right. These voter uh, suppression laws are not are being passed by one party. They are happening. It's be, they're being passed by Republicans in certain states, 19 of them uh, at this point. Um, it's true that there are some laws passed by incumbent Democrats who are trying to protect incumbency in a few Democratic states, but laws like Georgia's, laws like Texas's, laws like Florida's, uh, that happens to be happening in Republican states. And, uh, and one of the, the passion at the beginning of our book uh, is really your passion. I, if, if I can, I don't want to claim your feelings, but I just want to say we share your passion, let me put it that way, um, because we talk about efforts to roll back the advances. We talk about efforts uh, that are, uh, you know, they're almost surgical to keep certain groups from voting and that the law you passed in this state was, you know, uh, you know bleed to death with a thousand cuts. It's a lot of little things systematically changed that make things more difficult and that lower turnout. And so, so I'm not a both sides -er. Um But what we, all right, and so the whole structure of our book is we know we can make it easier for people to vote. We know that people have given their blood and their time and their effort to guarantee the right to vote uh, for everyone. And so we begin with the reforms we need that you would support to make it easier to vote. We have a line in the book uh, from a, an election lawyer who said that you know, long lines are voter suppression in action. Uh, because if you've got to wait six hours to vote, some people have to drop off that line. Um, and w uh, President Obama appointed a bipartisan commission that said no one should wait more than half an hour to vote. Uh, that should be the rule. We should have enough polling places. We also talk about how we underfund election administration, by the way, in our country. And it's not surprising because in a meeting of a city council, if it's a school or voting administration, the, the, the education is going to win. But we got to appreciate how important it is to build an infrastructure for elections that allows everybody to vote in a convenient way. But we want to put this out there precisely because we want to end uh, a system where this is at issue election after election after election and you make enormous gains in one election and then suddenly you see all of this retrogression. We want to say once and for all, Everybody has a right to shape our country's future, and because they have that right, they have an obligation to use that right to shape uh, our country's uh, future. And I'll let Miles close. I, I just want to close with this. A lot of people look at an idea like this and say, oh, nice idea, it works in Australia, uh, but we're not going to adopt that. Um, all, everybody in this room takes for granted the fact that we cast our ballot in secret, that we have the secret ballot. Uh, the secret ballot was a radical innovation uh, when it, uh, when it w began to uh, pa uh, pass around the country. It began in Australia. It used to be known as the Australian ballot. Um, you used to cast your ballot in, in the open for a party. Everybody saw how you were voting, and it was very controversial uh, to uh, adopt the secret ballot. There were struggles across states and you know in the late 19th and early 20th century and by the early 20th century everybody voted in secret so what we're trying to say is you know there were problems of intimidation then too because the party boss could know how you voted your employer could know uh, how you voted we got over that hurdle and now everybody takes the secret ballot for granted we are hoping uh, that we could have a day where everybody takes for granted that everybody votes and again, thank you for your witness today. Yeah, I found what you said really, really moving, and uh, I thank you for it as well. 
Um, you know, there is uh, uh, a faction. I, I, wanna, I don't want to say it's the Republican Party, because I know a number of secretaries of yeah. the state who are Republicans who really did good work uh, during 2020, during the pandemic, to make sure that do it and take their responsibility seriously. But there is a faction that currently at least resides in the Republican Party. Once upon a time, it resided in the Democratic Party. Um, that is attempting to enshrine white minority rule at all costs in this country. That's the agenda. That agenda has to be fought with every ounce of energy that we have, whether it's in litigation, and I applaud the ACLU and the other organizations who are fighting in courts, and in, in 2020, uh, generally speaking, the courts held. The courts held the line to protect the right to vote. Uh, I think they will continue to do that. I'm worried about the Supreme Court like everybody is, but I think in, in general that needs to be fought in legislatures. It needs to be fought in the streets. It needs to be fought in the elections, et cetera. That has to be pushed back. And, um, you know, it, it's not like we don't understand that that is an essential thing. But I guess we also want to say, even while we are doing playing that defense to the best of our ability, we also need to be think, you know, that song, Don't Stop Thinking About Tomorrow. Let's not assume the worst. Let's assume that we can get through and we can keep our democracy. Let's also think about what it is that we would really, really like to see. So I want to see 100% democracy where everybody is participating. The people who are standing in the way of that have to be moved out of the road. But I also think that we have to think about what can, uh, what can get us to that point. And so it's been my privilege to work with EJ on thinking about tomorrow. Uh, and we hope that we can make some progress towards getting there. So thanks a lot, all of you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, all three of you. This really was a, a phenomenal night, and thanks to all of you. Uh, EJ uh, will um, will uh, also, uh, um, both of the authors, Miles and EJ, will, will join us down at the table here where they can sign copies of 100% Democracy. The copies of Flip that you've heard so much about are already signed. Greg stopped by the store uh, when it uh, came out, so you can still pick up a copy of that out in the lobby. Uh, if you want to get your book signed, if you would line up on that side and we'll follow you across there and then you can exit on this side. Thanks again so much for coming and thanks to the three of y'all.